Building a PC yourself means you can tailor it to your exact requirements. In this nine step video, we're going to show you how to put all of the components together. You can find some suggestions of what to buy on our website at www.computeractive.co.uk slash 2192451, but do remember that specs and deals are always changing. The good news is that you won't need any unusual tools to make your computer, just a screwdriver with a Phillips head. All the screws you'll actually be using should be included with the case and the components. The only other requirement is a clear area to rest the computer on its side, with enough space to lay out the pieces before fitting them. Now you may also want to use an anti-static wrist strap, as static on your body can damage computer components. A wrist strap and a special connector to the earthing pin in a main socket can be bought for about £20 from Maplin. Alternatively, you can just touch something that's earthed to discharge any static. The best choice for this is a piece of bare radiator pipe. The first steps are to fit the processor, heatsink and memory. As these can be a little fiddly, we think that it's best to fit them outside of the case. Take the motherboard out of its box and the anti-static bag. Close the box, lay the bag on top and place the motherboard on top of both. Open the latch over the CPU socket on the motherboard and lift up the cover. Remove the plastic cap fitted over the socket. The connecting pins for Intel chips are on the motherboard and they're very small and fragile, so be careful not to bend them with any uneven movement. Lift the cap straight up. Open the processor packaging and carefully remove the heatsink. Place it on one side and you'll now be able to access the processor itself, which is inside some small plastic packaging. Be very careful not to touch the gold connections on the bottom. To make sure that the processor is installed correctly, there are beveled corners, a gold triangle that matches a similar triangle on the socket, and a notch on two sides. Make sure all of these match up with the socket. Insert the processor straight down into the socket. Don't try and insert it at an angle, one edge first, or even slide it into place. Once it's in, close the cover plate, making sure that the tabs on the other end to the hinges fit underneath the post, and replace the locking lever to its original locked position. Now it's time to fit the heatsink. Turn the four locking pins round so that the arrows are pointing away from the center. Hold the heatsink over the processor, being careful of course not to drop it, and look for the four holes in the motherboard that correspond with the legs on the heatsink. There is no correct way round as such, but make sure that the cable for the fan will reach the CPU fan socket on the motherboard. Press the heatsink into place evenly and then press the locking pins into place in a crisscross pattern. There should be an audible click as they fit into place and the heatsink will then be firmly attached to the motherboard. Don't forget to plug in the fan cable. After the processor, fitting the memory is very simple. The memory slots normally to the right of the processor and there will be either two or four as memory is installed in pairs. If you have two memory sticks and four slots, consult the manual to check which slots to insert the memory in. Pull back the locking levers on either side of the memory slots and align the memory chip into place, looking for the notch on the bottom of the memory card, which makes sure that it's installed the right way round. Once it's the right way round, press it into place firmly and both locking clips should then click upright. If they won't press in or only one presses in, the memory chip might be the wrong way round. Check the notch and try again. The motherboard does not rest directly on the case. Instead, there are small copper or brass risers that hold it clear from the metal sides. As different motherboards have different combinations of mounting holes, the case will have lots of holes into which you should fit these mounting risers. Hold the motherboard over the case and take note of which holes match up with those on the motherboard. Screw in the mounting risers into these holes. The motherboard should be supplied with a backing plate that goes around the connections at the back. This can be pressed into place by hand, but we've often found a careful tap or two with the butt of a screwdriver helps seat it properly. With the backing plate in place it's now time to fit the motherboard. We think the easiest way to do this is to align the connections on the back of the motherboard with the backing plate and then let the motherboard sit flat inside the case. 
Take the screws and screw the motherboard into the riser sockets that we fitted earlier. You'll need to do this for a good four or five screws. Make sure that they're firmly in place so that the motherboard doesn't come loose, but don't over tighten them. Once the motherboard's in place, it's time to connect the power to it. Firstly, let's connect this smaller power socket to the plug next to the processor. And then this is the main power supply plug and that goes into the big white socket on the edge of the motherboard there. Make sure that they click firmly into place. The graphics card fits into the biggest slot on the motherboard, the PCI Express 16X slot. Match up the backing plate on the case and remove it. Sometimes these plates are held in place with the screw and other times they must be broken off. Align the card with the slot and press it firmly into place. Sometimes there's a special clip or retainer on the slot on the inside end. Check whether this needs to be held open to allow the card into place. Fix the card into place by using the screw that was holding the backing plate. If the graphics card has extra power sockets, make sure they're all connected now. The fiddliest bit of building a computer is fitting the front panel lights as well as the power and reset buttons. As there is no standard layout, each light or button has a separate connection to fit on the header pins on the motherboard. The motherboard manual is your friend here, as it will describe which pins do what, although they normally have this marked on the motherboard as well. Take it slowly and you'll get there in the end. The audio and USB plugs have a blocked hole that ensures they are plugged in the right way round. Optical drives are simple to fit. Select a spare 5 and a quarter inch bay on the case and remove the front panel. Sometimes there's an extra metal plate that must also be removed behind this. Slide the drive in from the front and match up the holes on the side with the holes on the side of the case. Now there may be several positions so make sure that it lines up with the front of the case so that you can replace the front panel but not so far back that the button on the front panel won't press the button on the optical drive. Then replace the front panel over the front of the optical drive. Finally, fit the long SATA power connector and the short SATA data connector into the back of the optical drive. Find a spare 3.5 inch bay on the inside of the case and insert the hard disk in it with the connections facing towards the motherboard. Screw it firmly into place. The final step is to connect the power using the long plug and the data using the short plug. The best practice is to connect the hard disk to the SATA socket with the lowest number. This should be marked 1, but some manufacturers decide to count from 0. With all the components fitted inside the case, it's time to connect all the external peripherals. The round purple and green sockets, or single socket, half purple and half green, are for PS2 type mouse and keyboards. The rectangular sockets are USB. If the plastic inside them is blue, then they're probably the very fastest USB 3, otherwise they will be USB or USB 2. The socket with two small LEDs is the network socket for connection to your router if you're not going to use wireless. The coloured round sockets are used for audio. Green should be connected to your speakers. Blue is stereo line level input and pink is the microphone socket. The connections on this graphics card include a blue VGA socket, a white DVI socket and a smaller HDMI socket.